Hello, everybody. I am John Allen, the editor of Crux. You can find us online at cruxnow.com. Also the host of this show, Last Week in the Church. This is the show where we raid the journalistic fridge, bust out some stories that are maybe by now a few days old, but we heat them up, serve them up piping hot and delicious. Here's what's on the menu this week. First, O oh Canada, Pope Francis is in Canada this week holding meetings, among other things, with representatives of the country's indigenous peoples and apologizing for a legacy of neglect and abuse at church-run residential schools in Canada. We'll examine why this trip is something of a high-wire act for the pontiff. Secondly, Opus Dei and the clipping of wings. Before he set out for Canada, Pope Francis issued a few changes to church law governing Opus Dei, to this day the only personal prelature in the Catholic Church. Most observers see this as an exercise in sort of clipping Opus Dei's wings. We'll explain what happened and what its consequences might be. Third, keeping the TLM on the DL in D.C. Cardinal Wilton Gregory issues new restrictions on celebration of the Latin Mass in the Archdiocese of Washington. This is in keeping with Pope Francis's liturgical policies. One parish there is pushing back. We'll take a look at what is going on. Fourth, the anti-Roman affect. That's the famous phrase that theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar used to diagnose what he saw as a resistance to Roman authority that is kind of part of the DNA of German Catholicism. It's flared up again this week with a kind of unusual spat between the Vatican and the leaders of the German Catholic Church over their synodal path. We'll try to unpack what's going on and, and what the importance of all that is. And then finally, here be dragons. Italy is setting off into uncharted political waters. We'll take a look at why that is of concern to Pope Francis and his Vatican team. All that and more is waiting for you on this edition of Last Week in the Church. So please, stay glued to your screens, stay stuck in your seats. Don't go anywhere. We're going to be right back. All right, everybody, happy Tuesday to you. Happy Tuesday in a sweltering late July here in Rome and probably wherever you are. Hope you're all staying safe and staying cool. We begin this week with Pope Francis in the true north. He is visiting the nation of Canada this week. Touchdown on Sunday in the city of Edmonton. Yesterday held a couple of meetings with indigenous persons in and around Edmonton. He'll be meeting with representatives of the indigenous groups in Canada throughout this week. And the leitmotif of this trip is apology. Pope Francis is in Canada primarily to apologize for the Catholic Church's role in what the Canadian government has called a cultural genocide directed against the indigenous persons of the country. Population-wise, there are about 1.7 million indigenous persons in Canada. That's about 5% of the national population. But historically, symbolically, culturally, politically, significance will be on those numbers. And it's also an extraordinarily complex landscape. There are more than 600 different indigenous groups in Canada, more than 50 separate indigenous nations, 50 separate indigenous languages. They don't all speak for, with one voice. They don't all see things the same way. What unites them at the moment is a kind of profound sense of betrayal and hurt as a result of the legacy of abuse of indigenous children at residential schools. These were schools set up by the Canadian government in the 19th and 20th centuries, but subcontracted, in a sense, to religious groups, the largest provider being the Catholic Church. And we now know, based on recent revelations, that there was a sorrowful and scandalous history of physical sexual, emotional, even cultural abuse at these schools. Recent revelations of the findings of bodies of some of these indigenous children in unmarked graves on the properties of these residential schools have generated a national scandal, a national sense of outrage that is difficult to underestimate. 
So Pope Francis, earlier this year, met with representatives of some of these indigenous peoples in Rome. He spent almost a week in these meetings, which is more time than he gives to heads of state. It's more time than he gives to visiting bishops, more time than he gives to almost anyone. And in these meetings, he apologized individually and then collectively for this legacy of abuse. It was made clear to him, however, when those meetings occurred, that what was truly important, given the sense of the sacredness of land among indigenous communities, was that he come to Canada and deliver these apologies. So that's what he's doing this week. It's worth remembering that earlier this month, Pope Francis canceled a long-planned trip to Africa, to South Sudan and the Democratic Republic of Congo, because of osteoarthritis in the right knee, which has largely confined him to use of a wheelchair and a cane. Yet, despite all that, he went ahead with this trip, which is one measure of how important it is to him personally, and I think also institutionally. Now, the expectation on this trip is that in addition to apologizing, Pope Francis and his presence in Canada will also light a fire under two long-held demands of these indigenous groups. One is that the church open its archives so that what happened to the children who were placed in these indigenous schools can be documented and their families and heirs can be made aware of their fate. Second is that the church will kickstart its efforts to pay reparation to survivors, families, and heirs of the victims of abuse at these schools. The Canadian bishops have pledged about $30 million. So far, they have raised in the neighborhood of $5 million of that pledge. The expectation is that the Pope is going to lend his personal moral authority to that effort. Now, both of these things are complicated. There is no central archive in Canada about these schools. Many of the records are actually government records rather than church records. The extent to which full closure is going to be able to be achieved remains to be seen. And also, raising money is also a complicated and tricky process. And even if the Pope could move the church to fulfill that $30 million pledge, not clear whether that's going to satisfy everybody, there have been complaints in the run-up to this trip from some of these indigenous groups that they weren't adequately consulted. Some are upset about the locations that the planners of the trip chose, which they felt privileged some indigenous groups over others. You know, we will have to see. That's why I say this trip is a high wire act. On the other hand, I will also say this. This is where Pope Francis shines. In these situations where he is face to face with people who have been victimized, brutalized, forgotten, abandoned, marginalized. This is Pope Francis's Elan Vital. And so, you know, we will have to see how people react to the aftermath of this visit. But my advice would be, don't bet against this pope in this kind of situation. Because, you know, this is, this is in a sense where the Pope of Mercy comes out to do his thing. All right. Secondly, Opus Dei and the clipping of wings. So, right before Pope Francis left for Canada, he issued yet another motu proprio. It's, it's almost his favorite kind of document. A motu proprio is where the Pope issues amendments to church law under his personal authority. He's issued more than any previous Pope. He is getting close to issuing more than, say, the last three or four Popes combined. And this latest one has to do with Opus Dei. Now, Opus Dei is, of course, an organization within the Catholic Church. Technically, it's a personal proletaire, the only one under church law. It was given that status by John Paul II in 1982. It's been controversial over the years for a number of reasons. Some think it's secretive and cult-like. Some think it is a kind of conservative shock force trying to roll back the clock on reforms associated with Vatican II. Some think it engages in bizarre spiritual practices such as corporal mortification. Of course, it was made famous in the Da Vinci Code, Dan Brown's, you know, pot boiler, on and on. Opus Dei was extraordinarily influential and favored in the John Paul years. 
slightly less so, but still favored under Pope Benedict. I, you know, it was clear from the beginning that it wasn't exactly Pope Francis's cup of tea. But on the other hand, Pope Francis has also had advisors and friends over the years who are members of Opus Dei. But I think, you know, it was all, always sort of baked into the cake of the Francis papacy that they were not going to be the 800-pound gorilla in the Pope Francis era that they were under John Paul II. And this has now come to sort of logical fruition with this motu proprio in which Pope Francis, well, he did a number of things, but probably the two most important are he has decreed that from now on, the head of Opus Dei, the prelate, is not going to be named a bishop. Two prelates of Opus Dei were named bishops under John Paul II. And secondly, he has said that supervision of Opus Dei in the Vatican is going to move from the Congregation for Bishops, which made it seem kind of like part of the hierarchy. It's now going to be under the Congregation for Clergy, which emphasizes that the priests of Opus Dei are just that. They are priests. They're, they're pastors. They're responsible for the care of souls, they are not going to be part of the hierarchy going forward. Now, for the average member of Opus Dei, does this really change very much? Really, no. Because for the typical lay person who belongs to Opus Dei, either in the States or anyplace else, really their connection to the group is the priest to whom they go for confession and spiritual direction. It's the other lay members of Opus Dei they meet with to talk about their faith journeys, and its devotion to St. Jose Maria Escrivá, the founder of Opus Dei. And frankly, whether the prelate is a bishop or not, where he fits exactly on the hierarchical map of the Catholic Church, who in the Vatican is overseeing the group, for most of them, they probably don't know and don't care. Now, for canon lawyers and theologians in Opus Dei, guys who are specialized in this kind of stuff, there is undoubtedly some heartburn about these decisions. There will be discussion of it going forward. But here is what I think you can take to the bank. Okay, Opus Dei is not going to be the big kid on the block under Pope Francis that they were under John Paul II, and they haven't been for the last more than nine years. However, they're also not going anyplace. Opus Dei has a reputation for being efficient, reliable, discreet, and competent. Which means even bishops who maybe aren't on the same wavelength theologically, nevertheless, like having Opus Dei around. Okay, so it's not everybody's cup of coffee, and it doesn't have the same favor under Pope Francis as earlier popes. Can you name me a single individual or organization in the Catholic Church that's ever made a difference that actually played to 100% positive reviews? I can't. And I'm something of an amateur church historian. I just don't think such an animal exists in the Catholic Zoo. You know, Opus Dei has been maybe cut down to size a little bit, but it's going to be fine. All right, third, the Latin Mass in D.C., the T.L.N. in D.C. So recently, Cardinal Wilton Gregory, who would be perceived as a kind of center-left prelate, basically in sync with Pope Francis, issued a new set of restrictions on celebration of the Latin Mass in the Archdiocese, this in keeping with Pope Francis's decrees. Basically, he has said that the Latin Mass no longer can be celebrated in functioning parishes. It can only be celebrated in three non-parochial churches in D.C., only on Sundays, not during Holy Week. Basically, he's kind of hemmed in the conditions under which the Latin Mass can be celebrated also said that any priest who wants to do it has to ask for specific permission and has to pledge his loyalty to the reforms, including the liturgical reforms of Vatican II. Now, understandably, this has produced some blowback from adherents of the Latin Mass. Specifically, there is a parish in D.C., the parish of St. Mary, Mother of God, where celebration of the traditional Latin Mass was a, heretofore a regular feature of parish life, and an important source not merely of at mass attendance in this parish, that is, the membership of the congregation, but also an important source of its financial contributions. And what members of the parish are saying right now is that when Cardinal Gregory 
conducted synodal, a kind of archdiocesan synod, and had listening sessions around the archdiocese, they participated. And they said, listen, if you pro prohibit us from being able to celebrate the Latin Mass, we're going to lose a good chunk of our membership, and we're going to lose a good chunk of our, our money, so please don't do it. Well, he did it anyway. They are now protesting that those listening sessions, they don't understand what the point was. If, you know, their pleas were just going to fall on deaf ears. They're also complaining of the possibility that there will be severe budget shortfalls in the parish and that in the end, it might have to close. And by the way, were that to happen, it wouldn't just be the Latin mass aficionados who would be disadvantaged because the parish also has a large Chinese community that gets a kind of separate spiritual ministerial care from the parish. Not entirely clear where those folks would go if St. Mary, Mother of God, were to have to, you know, cut back or, worst case scenario, shut down. So they are appealing to the cardinal and to the archdiocese for a rethink. It will be interesting to see how all this plays out, because on the one hand, you could say, but listen, all the cardinal really is doing is trying to enact the pope's own directives which have called for significant restrictions on celebration of the Latin Mass and that in the main, routine liturgical and pastoral life should be celebrated according to the Reformed Liturgy of the Second Vatican Council. On the other hand, you could also say that Cardinal Gregory, for whom tolerance and inclusion and diversity are core values and always have been, you know, when he was the president of the Bishop's Conference, when he was the Archbishop of Atlanta, and now that he is the Cardinal Archbishop of D.C. These are watchwords for his pastoral administration. It will be interesting to see how he reconciles those values against the clear liturgical directives that have been given by Pope Francis and his Vatican team, and how all of that plays out. All I can say is, this is another lesson in how it is complicated to be a Catholic bishop these days and how usually you face tough decisions to which there are no obviously right answers. Obviously at Crux, we will continue to pay attention to how Cardinal Gregory tries to sort of put the square peg into the round hole that is the conundrum of the Latin Mass these days. All right. Fourth, we shift scenarios to Germany. Now, so, some time ago, the leadership of the German Catholic Church, in this case, including the Bishops' Conference in Germany and also the largest organization of Catholic laity in Germany, announced they were going to be staging what they are calling a synodal path. Basically, they're not calling a synod, but a path that is synodal. Basically, it's a kind of gigantic listening session up and down Germany about how the country's Catholics feel, about the state of the church and where it should go from here. A lot of this is an effort to recover from the painful legacy of the clerical abuse scandals, which rocked Germany just as they have other parts of the Catholic world. However, what has surfaced as part of this synodal path is, at least in some circles, a desire for change that goes well beyond the specific management of clerical abuse. It includes things like whether we ought to be blessing same-sex unions, whether priests ought to be able to be married, whether laity ought to have a greater role in the selection of bishops, and on and on. Some critics of this process feel that this could be a kind of second Protestant Reformation in Germany that could lead to a kind of formal schism in the church. Now, those fears certainly have reached the Vatican, and last week the Vatican put out a statement by the way, an unsigned statement, so it wasn't clear which Vatican agency or personality it came from. It was simply issued by the press office in the name of the Vatican, which was essentially a shot across the battle at the center of the path, saying it didn't have any authority to force individual bishops to make changes in church teaching or church practice, and that those decisions had to be made not at the national level, but at the level of the universal church. Now, in response, the kind of founders of the feast, that is, the head of the German Bishops' Conference and the head of this group of German Catholic laity, put out a statement saying they were astonished by this criticism, 
saying that, you know, we have been asking for the opportunity to sit down and discuss these concerns with you. You never, you being the Vatican, saying you never responded to these requests to, these, to this day. We haven't had the chance to talk things out with you. We are fully aware that issues of church teaching and practice have to be discussed at the universal level. And basically, we don't know why you're picking on us, was the gist of it, in a sort of response that will probably be especially nettlesome for Pope Francis and his team. They said, this is not a very senatorial way of doing business. Bear in mind, of course, that being senatorial is kind of the buzzword par excellence of the Francis papacy. All of this building to the Synod of Bishops on Synodality next year. I think probably what all this illustrates is that on the side of the Vatican and critics of this synodal path, there is real concern about where all this is leading and whether it is just going to spin out of control, produce new heartache, new disappointment, new ruptures in the German Catholic Church. On the German side, there is a sense of incomprehension and kind of a priori, our a priori prejudice in the Vatican, and also the reactions of certain bishops around the world, including a handful of American prelates who have warned about the prospect of schism and all of this. And it probably suggests that when Pope Francis gets back from Canada, yeah, he's still going to have to deal with the war in Ukraine. He's going to have to deal with preparations for the Senate. There's a lot on his plate, but probably high up that to-do list is also figuring out what to do about Germany and how to turn this anti-Roman affect into some spirit of dialogue in common cause. All right, finally this week, we end up in Il Bel Paese, our home here in Italy, where the government of Prime Minister Mario Draghi, a government of national unity, fell apart last week. I would tell you why, but frankly, I still don't quite understand it, and I'm not sure anybody does. The triggering event was one of the members of his coalition, a kind of leftist populist movement known as the Five Stars, essentially bolted from the coalition, which brought the whole house of cards falling down. And now snap elections have been set for September 25th. Mario's, Mario Draghi's last name, by the way, in Italian means dragons. And it's an apt term because in pre-modern maps of the world, cartographers would usually draw pictures of dragons and other mythical sea creatures in unknown territory. It was basically a heads up that we don't know what's out there, but it could be dangerous. Well, Italy right now is moving into uncharted waters. We don't know what's going to happen in these elections on September 25th. However, the most likely outcome, according to polls right now, is a victory for the Italian center-right, which would mean some sort of return to power for the far-right anti-immigrant Lega Party, led by Italian politician Matteo Salvini, who is a Bible and rosary brandishing traditionalist devotee of Metagorgia, who in Italian political terms is seen as sort of the anti-Pope Francis. I mean, if you were to do an x-ray of the opposition to Pope Francis in Italy and in Italian Catholicism, and then do an x-ray of Salvini's electoral support, they would look really, really similar. By the way, Salvini on Monday, said that if the center-right wins the elections, the first thing that is going to mean is zero illegal immigrants in Italy. In other words, he is vowing ferocious crackdown on immigration across the board for a pope who sees himself as a champion of migrants, refugees, and immigrants. That obviously is not a positive weather forecast. Further, the Vatican has always taken Italian politics especially seriously because they see Italy as its natural partner on the global stage. They like it when Italy's diplomatic priorities and the Vatican's priorities are in lockstep 
because they feel like Italy will amplify their voice and have their back in a way that no other sovereign nation is probably ever likely to do, because the Vatican is here. It's in the Italian backyard. So when the Italian government and the regime in power in the Vatican are at loggerheads, the Vatican always thinks that is a very worrying prospect. And so the great likelihood is that they are not going to be looking at these late September elections with you know, a spring in their step and a twinkle in their eye, but more likely with some sense of alarm and trepidation. It will be very interesting to see how the Vatican reacts, what messages it tries to send, and also the leadership of the Italian Catholic Church, bearing in mind that the new president of the Italian bishops, Cardinal Matteo Zuppi of Bologna, is very much Pope Francis's guy and if you were going to go to a Las Vegas betting house right now for the next pope and try to lay odds, you would find Zuppi would be at the top of the list in terms of candidates, what, what Italians call papabili, that is, people take seriously as possible the next pope. So how both the Vatican and Che, the Italian Bishops Conference, try to navigate these uncharted political waters it is going to be a fascinating summer story. All I can say is the meteorological heat in Italy right now is thoroughly matched by the political heat in this country, and that includes the role of the Catholic Church. All right, that is our show for this week. Thank you for dialing in. You can find full coverage of all these stories on the Crux site. Again, that is cruxnow.com your one-stop shopping destination for the very best in smart, wired, and independent Catholic journalism. We will be back here next week, same time, same place, same bat channel. So please be back with us. Tell your friends and neighbors, give us a like, give us a thumbs up, give us a positive review online. We would be eternally grateful. And in the meantime, my charge to you is during the next week, stay safe, stay healthy. Above all, stay cool, beat the heat, ladies and gentlemen. Have a fantastic and blessed week, and we will talk to you again soon.